uh, as part of the conference on uh, exploring the what and how of deep, of deep learning. I'm so pleased that this session is, is part of the conference, and I'm pleased that you're here, Catherine. Conversations is what we're here to have, and this is a great topic for a conversation, I think. Um, I'm Mark Lewis, and um, I just want to welcome you to critical talking about critical thinking to engage our students, and that's, um, uh, as, as Catherine mentioned, she is presenting solo to, to you today, and we'll make this as interactive as possible, uh, but we have the whole time. Uh, Catherine has a PhD in American Studies and teaches American Studies here at UMass Boston, um, and she also has been a journalist for many, many years, alongside being a teacher for those many years. And she um, is specializes in audio production and all kinds of interesting things that are, I think, hopefully ones that uh, we can learn more about as, as, we, as we get to know you. So I'll turn the microphone over to Catherine, and I'll fix the slides as you And do you, do you want me to it's, stick this on? You can just like put it on a lapel if, if you Done. want. Done. OK. So good morning. Um, thanks for showing up. And I'm hoping that I can show you the kind of conversation that I have been really lucky to be able to engage in over the last year or so. Um, I am subtitling this dialectic at the dog park, and you'll see why in just a minute. Um, this is a bad picture uh, from left to right. This is Amos and Zorba. That's me. And this is Evangeline, who's not with us this morning. Evangeline and I uh, sort of fell into step at our local dog park a little over a year ago. Um, we have two of the very best dogs in the world. And they became great friends and loved to play together. Evangeline was new to the neighborhood. And as we began getting to know each other through our dogs, uh, we began to learn a little bit about what each of us does, and it turns out that Evangeline is a specialist in education, in the training and teaching of teachers. Um, <laughs> that's a problem. Um, and I don't know if I would call myself a specialist, but I have been involved and engaged in teaching in the humanities for at least three decades, if not more. Um, I care about the humanities probably more than your average bear. Uh, I believe in the importance of speaking, reading, and writing critically. Um, but when I landed at UMass Boston uh, three years ago, I was not really prepared to translate my passionate belief into a positive classroom experience for students. So I showed up here and I was very excited by the concept of universal de design. Wanted to make sure that whatever I put together in terms of a syllabus would be accessible to everyone. And what I didn't think about was who the students at UMass Boston are, what their challenges might be, and what I might need to be doing to change my approach so that the kinds of beliefs that I still cling to could find root in particularly fertile soil here. So I needed to learn some new tricks. And so I want to walk you through some of what came about. Um, so I want to do two things really here. Um, I want to show you how one specialty knowledge about early America, cultural studies, communication, and a passion for my content area, and a, a real belief in the beauty of abstraction. That wasn't translating very well. And the conversation with Evangeline, her passion for learning and assessment and training, um, her understanding of the importance of development in all people, and her very practical approaches, why that conversation was so important. So Evangeline and I, when we're thinking about what our essential questions are, one is a fairly basic one. How do you assess and teach all students? It's kind of a no-brainer. Everybody in here probably has been thinking about that. Um, but how do we have conversations to make that happen? So I'm kind of wanting to work on two levels with you. One, 
what does a conversation between an education specialist and a content specialist look like? And then two, what are some of the practical suggestions that came out of that conversation? What do those look like? So I remember when I started teaching at Harvard 50,000 years ago, uh, somebody handed me William James's Talks to Teachers. I'm probably not got the title quite right. And I remember diving into that and thinking, what? And it was a sort of a heady, philosophical, wonderful uh, meditation from you know, long ago on what it means to be a teacher. But it didn't really say anything about what was supposed to happen in the classroom. And I felt very strongly that there were two modes. There was lecturing and there was section. Right? So the lecturing was the delivery of the content, and the section was the place, unless this was a seminar, the section was a place where the, the discussion would happen. And the assumption was that students were both ready to receive the information in terms of the lecture, and they knew how to have the conversation. Right? So there you are. But what if you're trying to figure out other modes and other ways? And this is long before people were talking about flipping the classroom or using technology. Okay. So I looked through a bunch of guides, books on you know, how to teach better at university level kinds of things. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sample from a particularly atrocious guide. Um, this was the kind of thing offered. Um, I'm not even going to name the guide, right? So this was under the section, Techniques for Developing Critical Thinking. Involve them in group decision making. Practice brainstorming a problem or an issue. Schedule mock trials and debates. Be creative. At, like this is creative. Ask for a 100-word analysis of the last class. Like that didn't feel very creative to me. And none of these suggestions actually engages with the problem of, well, what do you do if students aren't ready to receive the lecture or to engage in a fruitful conversation? Right? If, they're, if they're really not at a place where they're really able to do either of these things, how is this going to help? Um, there are so many other extremely offensive parts of this book that I'm skipping over, um, having to do with race, having to do with gender, with class. The last section of this particular book is, perhaps teaching is not the right, uh, th is not the right profession for you, which I just thought was insulting. Like, here's this book that's supposed to be inspiring you, and, and he, he ends off saying, maybe you should go sell books. I, you know, it's just really bad. So. Um, when we began to talk, Evangela and I, um, we were really sort of starting this thing, and what I hit on was the problem here has to do with abstraction, moving between extremely abstract concepts and extremely concrete details. So the assumption often in university hiring is that the committee is looking for top flight thinkers who research and publish. So really the reason that universities recruit faculty is because of their profound abilities to abstract, right? We're not at, at a university level, we're generally, especially in the humanities, we're not recruited because we know anything about teaching. Nobody's ever really taught us how to teach, right? So we know how to ask great questions, we know how to do research, we may be great writers. But we don't necessarily know anything about how to translate this into a classroom. Often the assumption is going to be that lecturing, and I think lecturing and a kind of a, a sort of high level discussion is what's going to be happening in terms of this teaching stuff. And there's really no um, discussion about how to prepare someone, especially in the humanities, but across all disciplines, to make an effective classroom. So I feel like there's a hole here that I certainly was looking to fill. And the results, and this should be at the top, not at the bottom, is really you wind up with frustrated professors and frustrated students, right? You're trying to do this sort of, you're, you're creating this feast for students and they can't necessarily uh, approach it or appreciate it. What do you do? So when you have no training in pedagogy, literacy, active learning, learning differences, multilingualism, um, no real training in how to get students to move between the most concrete and the most abstract, you know, how does the classroom work? So if you believe passionately in the importance of critical thinking 
analysis, right, the importance of language spoken and written in facilitating this kind of deep engagement, how is that supposed to happen, right? So again, this hole and how to fill it. So we fell in step with each other, and this was our critical conversations about critical thinking skills. And so we began to walk around the edge of this lovely dog park, and our conversations began to sound like this. So these are my dog park dialectics. This is number one. So I would say things like, Evangeline, why can't my students, why can my students summarize, but they can't argue? Like, I, you know, the best of them, I can give them uh, something fairly easy to read, and they can spit back out at me what they've read. But they can't use what's in it to argue. And Evangeline would say, well, what do you think students need to be able to argue? Now, Evangeline's Greek, Greek-American, so the dialectic is very important here, right? We're going back to Plato. So I would say students need evidence to argue. They need to be able to use what they've read to support a bigger point. I tell them to take notes, but their notes are usually terrible. So I realized somewhere early on that I was giving them material and saying, you know, you take notes on this, and then you're going to use your notes to create an essay or to come in and argue. And it took me a semester or two to think, you know, I probably have to take a look at those notes. Or maybe I should give them to my TA, and she could take a look at those notes. So Evangeline said, have you considered giving them a note-taking template and having a TA check the notes? So I thought about that. And I thought, OK, I'm going to create a note-taking template for primary and secondary sources. So this is the secondary source note form. And I post it on, I use a live guide and not Blackboard. But I post the forms under course documents. And students can download them as a Word document. They can type their notes in. right? The, the form goes on and on. They can you know, do whatever they want. But I give them some, some areas to figure out, well, where should material go? So I also figured out pretty fast that it would be helpful if I put at the very top, after you've read once, go back, summarize, what's the main point, and then include the page numbers where you can identify the passages, right? Because if we come together in class and I want them to say, you know, on page 32, Thoreau says, right, whatever it is, they need to be able to access that. And so uh, if I ask them in their essays, which are based on their readings, that they need to have p at least parenthetical citations, right? They need to show where they've gotten their information from. They need to get in the habit of writing down the page numbers. Now, I walked into you and be thinking, everybody knows how to do this, and I was wrong, right? So I didn't know this. Um, Note-taking form for primary sources. So one of the things that I'm also trying to do with students is to say, this book that is bound is not a novel, right? They call everything novels, right? <laughs> so to be able to get them to differentiate between the kinds of sources that they're reading turned out to be a very important first step, which Evangeline helped me think about. So I decided, you know, actually having two different note forms would be helpful because we read primary sources and secondary sources differently. You don't come to text the same way. Yes, OK. So how do you begin to prime a student to think about the way they might be using a primary source to create an argument? And what can you do to front load that before they've even sat down to open up whatever it is that you're asking them to read? So categories, what is known, what can be argued, and again, where are they going to find this when they go back? Also being able to talk to students about pre-reading. They've got pre-reading questions in the syllabus, on the live guide, right? How do I get them to move from that to when they sit down? Maybe they need to read the piece once through, all the way before they take notes to speed up the process. So thinking with them about techniques, ways to approach what I'm asking them to do. So I thought I was doing great, right? Here I have my note taking. And this is you know, the, the forms, and this is so super, and it's going to be so great. So Evangeline says, you know, well, how's it going with those note-taking forms? And I said, well, you know, the ones who are really doing this are really improving, but I can't get everybody to do it. And it's frustrating. Again, it's frustration, right? And Evangeline, you know, again, a critical question. Why do you think they don't do the reading? Why? Because there I am thinking, like, you know, this reading is so great. 
how can anyone live without this reading, right? So I say to her, well, you know, we're, we're walking, the dogs are running, playing. You know, they're working 40 hours a week, they're raising kids. Uh, their first language is in English. They're exhausted. Um, you know, and they're not, this is, and this really interesting to me. They're not used to reading real documents. They're used to being given a textbook. So in addition to teaching in American Studies, I'm also teaching in the Honors College. And I wound up this semester with a class that is 80% bio majors. And I'm trying to do humanities with them. They don't get the first principle, which is, why is humanities the best thing in the world, right? <laughs> which, of course, it is. And you know, two, it's not a textbook. So we, I had students saying, I haven't been asked to do this kind of reading since high school. I don't know how to read this. I have no idea what to do with this. I thought, you know, you know, 15-page academic article. It's really nicely written. It's, you know, beautiful. Da, da, da. They had no clue what to do with this. It hadn't even occurred to me that the note-taking forms that I had created for this lower-level class would be useful in an honors college setting. Again, I'm not necessarily the smartest bulb in the pack when it comes to doing these practical things. I'm learning. All right, so I say to Evangel, and well, this is, this is sort of what we're up against. Um, and she said, well, you know, what does this sort of look like? And I said, well, bef you know, this is what I do. So I thought, fancy me, I have this live guide, and I've got a little URL, and all I have to do is click to it, and they're going to go to it. And I'm saving them money because they don't have to buy this book, right? So they go to uh, Project Gutenberg that has all of the text, and then, it, you know, you can click on each of these things. They just have to look down. They have to find the right link, but it matches exactly what I've asked them to do, right? And if I'm lucky and they followed all the steps, they wind up here, right? <laughs> now, for those of you who are teaching at UMass Boston, you know, in a kind of general population or requirement course, now I know students look at that and they go, ah! Right, exactly, right, right. But I thought, you know, super me, like, this is such a great thing. Like, they didn't have this back when I was, you know, picking potatoes, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I missed my audience. Okay, so it's too many steps to get to the reading, too much reading, not enough scaffolding. So students um, could, you know, they couldn't really understand the key terms. They had no idea what they were looking for. And so I abridged it on my own. It's in the public domain, right? I don't have to ask to be able to abridge Thoreau at this point. It's, you know, it's more than 75 years old. I created a PDF out of it. I also created a glossary. And now, and I can upload this to my reserved readings. You know, there are lots of ways to do this. And now it looks like this. I have created my own document. I can make the font big, or they can make the font big if they want to. I've pulled out things that, I mean, if you'd asked me 30 years ago if I would ever have done something like this, I would say, I would never touch the text, it's sacred, right? But look, here's the thing, if they're not gonna read it, how sacred is it? So, you know, if, I, <laughs> if you can put it into a format and boil it down in a way that's more friendly for them, and then terms that I, again, I would have assumed, everybody knows what an aristocracy is or what an aristocratic is, but they don't, right? So, and they're not gonna take the step to go look it up. Right? That's not going to happen on this campus and these classrooms. So give them the glossary with the terms. Now, is still everybody going to do it? Well, maybe not, but I'm increasing, I'm pumping some air in and increasing the likelihood. So there we're walking. Evangeline, I spend so much time on my class website explaining assignments. Why don't students follow the instructions? Like, I don't get this. You're like, I'm putting it all here for them. Evangeline, what do these assignments look like? Well, I give them background information. And then they're supposed to follow live links or go to e-reserves to read. Let's take a look. So in my home office, we're sitting there looking. And she says, whoa, too many words. You wouldn't know that from me talking right now, would you, right? So too many steps. So I changed the format on the website to look like this. So for the same bit of Tocqueville. She said, you know, why don't you try making sure that you, in bold and, you know, large print, say, read this first, right? Now read this. 
and take notes and tell them which, which source form to use. It's clear, it's direct, it seems like a no-brainer, right? But this brain, I had no idea to know how to do this and why this kind of step would increase the chances that students would begin to move between most basic concrete steps and thinking and thoughts and abstract thinking and thoughts. All right, I think students are filling in the note forms after they've come to class, right? So here I am and I've, I've made these fabulous forms and I've set it up so that my TA is supposed to check these periodically throughout the semester. And the TA is wonderful and warm and nice but kind of has no idea what to look for. And after I start taking a look, it's clear to me that what students are doing is filling in the note forms after they've come to class. They're not, they're not so dumb, these ones, right? They're, they're, you know, if they've got to do this. So, Evangeline, how can you build in accountability? It's like, account but, but the ideas are so beautiful. Why doesn't everybody just, right, no, okay. So I said, well, what about quizzes? And she said, what's your goal? So I thought about this and did some looking around. And I thought, well, what if I build in six very basic quizzes. They're pop quizzes throughout the semester. And I'll drop the lowest grade. So if they miss the quiz, you know, one of them, you know, they, they, they get a free pass. And here's the, here's the kicker. What if the quizzes are open note but closed book? So I'm encouraging them to use those note forms or something like those note forms, right? And as long as they keep them printed, they can't have access electronically. As long as they keeping, keep them printed and in a binder, they can pull them out to complete the quiz. And the quizzes are really fairly basic. They're each worth five points, three multiple choice or you know, fairly easy fill in the blank kinds of questions, and then one question at the bottom that's a little more complicated, a little more interpretive. What's the point of the chapter? Um, you know, why did the author call the chapter X? Right? And the thing is, even though I felt like this was a kind of teaching that wasn't what I wanted to be doing, it helped me get to the kind of teaching I wanted to be doing, right? So by building in that accountability and getting them, giving them rewards for doing the basic prep work, the students were far more ready to discuss, way better able to connect evidence and argument and this also, because I don't want to be talking to students for an hour and 15 minutes every time we meet, right? That's not my goal. But it's pretty hard to move students into small groups when, you know, at least, what, half of them, 30% of them aren't prepared, right? It's, it's very hard to have them do meaningful work. So if I can get them working on the concrete level and taking the notes, they're better they're, they're ready to hit the ground running. Now, does this always work? No, but we can talk about that. All right, me, they can't write. Evangeline, of course they can't write. What do you mean, of course? They've been MCAST to death, right? So I'm, you know, I'm there like, yeah, they can't write. They don't, they can't put together. She's like, stop blaming them, right? Um, what happened to evaluate this? Or please respond to that as a kind of classic humanities type question. She says, they haven't learned it. You can't blame them teach them, model for them. And I say, my usual, how? Because I don't have the practical, I'm, I'm, I haven't been to education school, right? I don't know necessarily how to put things together in a classroom where this is really going to happen. And she says, well, they need a visual guide. That's what they're used to. I'm not a good visual thinker. Many of you may be. I'm not. So I thought about it. What is it that I'm asking to do? Okay, so what do you need to write an essay in the humanities often? You need an argument and you need evidence, right? You need to be able to move between the two. So the note-taking forms and the work that we're doing in class is helping them I identify what evidence is, right? They need topic sentences. They need to learn to move sources into one paragraph. They don't need to summarize one source, summarize another source, Summarize. Like, that's not an essay, right? An essay is you've got an idea and you're bringing evidence together from a bunch of different sources. They don't know how to do this, right? So just by giving them a graphic organizer and printing it out, you know, and telling them a topic sentence 
organizes your thoughts. It argues. It looks two ways. It always looks back to your thesis or argument, and it always looks forward to the evidence. Right? So I've given them something that's visual as well as a, a, an oral and a written description of what I want them to do. Now, uh, just a parenthetical aside. I understand why professors often ask students, you know, well, what did you like? You know, what do you think? What did you like? Or how does this relate to your life? And I understand why those are powerful questions, and I have a certain amount of respect for those. But I also think there's a difference between an opinions and ideas. And I feel like this thing about critical thinking and analysis and engagement is helping students understand the difference between an opinion, I liked it, I didn't like it, it was hard, it was easy, and an actual idea. Um, when we talk about analysis, we really need to be thinking about ideas. And so students who are used to turning in six pages of first-person prose as an essay, that may be fine, but it's not what I'm looking for. And I am unyielding in a way because I don't want first person. I really do believe in the academic exercise of sorting through ideas, evaluating them, and beginning to put them together as evidence. Right, looking for this stuff and moving it. So if you do believe that, and you do think that's an important skill for informed citizens and future employees, you've got to find some way to help them begin to move information around. Maybe you all already do this really well. I sure didn't. So talking to them, what is abstract? What is concrete? Right? How do you begin to move between these two things? talking to them about clustering by topic or islands, that you don't even need to know where everything's going. Uh, trying to make a mess and clean it up. Time is the most valuable resource that students at this university have. Right? They don't have the time that most students do at four-year universities in Boston. It's just they don't have it, right? And the process of writing takes time. So shorter assignments, um, you know, ways around uh, the last minute push and that's the final thing that they give, building and revising. These help um, because students don't have the time on their own and they, for lots of reasons, they're not in the habit of being asked to make the mess, uh, sort through, and move into those topics, move stuff around. So dog park dialectic six. How'd it go today? Students have opinions, not ideas. They tell me what they like, they summarize, but they can't argue. Evangeline says, you know, this is high school. You know, what were you working on? And I, you know, as usual, uh, good humanities gal, like I have these documents and they're so great and I love them, right? These early newspapers. And Evangeline says, well, they're great to you, but what makes them great to students? Right? I don't necessarily always ask that. It's like, well, I love them, so shouldn't everybody? So I explained to her, this is a unit on the consumer revolution at the beginning of the 19th century. If you look at the last page of this four-page PDF I've had scanned of this newspaper from 1826, you can see the actual ads. You can see how goods and materials move around, you know, it's, it's just all, so, they're selling umbrellas in 1826, like it's just so wonderful, right? So she says, remember, they need to know why they are reading. And you have to pick out a small, manageable amount for them. And so she says, what are you doing in class with the material? And I'm still like, but look, Evangeline, look, this is so wonderful. And she's like, well, you know, to them it's just this undifferentiated mass of information. Right? So how do you take, if you, if you are like me, in that you are not uh, a, a ready and early adopter or adapter of textbooks, and you want to find rich and interesting primary documents, how do you take them and turn them into something that's really meaningful for these students? All right? So for me it was, you know, scan the first three pages of the document, read the last one, and we'll come in and we'll talk about it. But that doesn't work. So Evangeline said, well, 
try dividing the students in class. Have them read before they come in. And then divide them into five small groups. Each group will be responsible for one column. And then give them a concrete question that is at the most basic level. Right? If the thing is you're trying to do is to get them to move between concrete and abstract, start them concrete. What is in the column? Right? Just list it. What's there? What do you see? All right? And then bring everybody back. The groups list what's in their columns. They may summarize by bean counting their X number of ads, these kinds of materials traveling, these kinds of distances, right? Very, very concrete. And then we come back and look at what's up on the board and begin to generate a thesis and topics just the way they would if they were writing an essay, right? So then to be able to move from these very specific concrete details to be able to say an analysis of a newspaper from 1826 suggests that, you know, you could be, and we begin generating. The students actually have to do this. We, you know, we practice it, or they write it down and hand it in, and I talk about it. But, you know, it may suggest uh, the distance that goods are traveling, or the range of goods, or thinking about global capitalism in the 1820s. My gosh, you know, there's a whole paragraph here on uh, what it would take to set up silk manufactories with silkworms in New England. Well, why would they do that? You know, what does that suggest? So working on this together and then connecting it to other readings. I mentioned Plato. Um, critical talking. The dialogue, the dialectic between two different specialties begins to generate practical suggestions that move students closer to the kinds of skills that I, and maybe others of you in here, want students to begin developing. How you get them there, I think it's not a, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated, it's trickier than you imagine. So, Plato from Phaedrus. A splendid pastime, Socrates, and what a contrast to those other base ones. When a man can find his recreation in words, I mean letting his imaginative discourse dwell on justice and the other subjects you mention. So it is, dear Phaedrus, but in this regard, far more noble and splendid is the serious pursuit of the dialectician who finds a congenial soul and then proceeds with true knowledge to plant and sow it in words, which are able to help themselves and help him who planted them. Words which will not be unproductive, for they can transmit their seed to her natures and cause the growth of fresh words in them providing external existence of their seed. Words which bring their possessor to the highest degree of happiness possible for a human being to attain. And I apply this both to my walks with Amos and Zorba and Evangeline, and also to what's happening in the classroom and what I'm hoping students will feel about the words and the documents that I'm asking them to engage with. So that is what I wanted to talk about with you. I'm really hoping that we can now have a conversation that is also a dialectic, a discussion and reasoning by dialogue as a method of intellectual investigation, specifically the Socratic techniques of exposing false beliefs and eliciting truth. Right? So in the time that we have left, I would love to be able to hear what you're doing in your classrooms, the conversations that you've had with others that seem to you fruitful or helpful, um, challenges, questions, thoughts. Thanks. Two part Number one, I didn't understand the question. Sorry. Oh, there's, no, there's, there's, there's no back. Okay, let's try this. Sorry. <laughs> Two yes. I, I did not understand the term scaffolding. scaffolding okay. Um, and then secondly, I'm frustrated because my students, I teach accounting. Okay. Very fact based and form of doing. Yep. And if they don't see a problem in the exact same format, we're, we're talking about the same problem. It's like, oh, I've never seen that before. Right. Right. So, okay, so let's start with scaffolding. Um, you want to build a pyramid, it will be tall. 
How do you get the person on the bottom up to the top? You need to build a scaffolding to help them get up there. So it's, a, it's an educational term to talk about the work that teachers do before they are actually engaging the students to help them get to where we want them. So what kinds of things can we build in, ladder-like, that will help move them and support them? Has anybody else got a better definition than I do? No, you're doing great. Yes. I, I've been teaching an advanced ESL course, and scaffolding is huge as far as a, a baseline methodology. And it's really thinking about what do the students already know? What are they coming into the classes with? And how can we build on that? So to me, it's like building on. All right, and so you're talking about, so this is brilliant. You're saying, you're teaching accounting, right? And what you're trying to do is teach them specific methods of identifying, solving, and producing, okay? But you want to evaluate them without having them just summarize back to you what you've shown, right? And this involves abstraction. So how do you begin to build in, before you get to the test, the kinds of thinking that you want them to do. They have to practice it in the classroom. And what would that look like? So what have you tried? Or are you just at frustration level? No, I mean, the microphone, I just realized if we take the microphone and move it around, I can facilitate that. That way we'll get your question. Okay. And I think though that you summarized the first two questions. Uh, what, I, what I do to get them prepared for an assessment is spend one class doing lecture, spend one class doing uh, in-class problems, I call it, where I put on the board, I put on in, in Blackboard, here's some problems, try the problems on your own, solutions are in another folder, but don't go to the solutions first, give it a try on your own, then check your work against the solutions. You know, by the way, we'll do it in class, because I know you have problems. I have something from uh, McGraw Hill called Learn Smart, which is a, you know, <clears throat> an uh, algorithmic-driven tool that gets electronic flashcards with the counting terms on it. And I have them do that for extra credit. And then before a test, we go over homework, because it's always due beforehand. So I think I've given them enough exposure to the kind of problems you know, I want them to be able to solve. And I still get, oh, I haven't seen that before. Mm. Yeah. So some of them, a lot of them don't come to class. You know, I, w I wish, well, I know, I, on any day, you say a lot of them don't come to class, so I'm taking attendance, you know, and there's actually points lost for not coming and you know they're all, we, we're teaching the same students here and this is also I wish Evangeline were here because she would have far more interesting things to say to you um, but what I can say is I think you need to break this down more um, you need to uh, when you say you have students doing the problems in class you probably need to have them in small groups you need to have you in your own mind you probably need to think about all right here's the question that, they, that I think they can answer, right? It's exactly like the question that, that they've had. Here's the slightly more difficult question, right? And then like build in a couple stages of that and have the students in groups together, you're not exposing anybody, work as a team. You can even design the groups ahead of time after you've had some initial, even ungraded assessments to know who are the stronger and weaker students and to try and make those groups up so that they're beginning to teach each other. The kinds of study groups that you and I would expect students to have on campuses, they don't have because they don't live here, right? You know, they're, they're, it's, they're lucky if it only takes them an hour to get to school, right? So how do you, I'm not, I mean, there's this fancy jargon about flipping the classroom. I, you know, flip or don't flip. I think all the elements need to be practiced at home and all the elements need to be practiced in the classroom. And figure, breaking that down, it's, you know, it's a, I, it's a ball buster, you know? you know, breaking it down so that you're actually figuring out, well, what are the cognitive steps that I need them to take? Because until I've identified what those are and then helped them walk through, I'm not actually teaching them. If they're not learning, I'm not teaching. Fair enough. I mean, it's, I mean other, I'm really curious to know, what do others of you think? What would you suggest? department um, and I just think UMass Boston's really lucky to have you. <laughs> I, I do. I think that um, w if you don't understand the students at UMass Boston then you're, it's, you're in a tough place. And I have been here for six years 
and I've taught at five other um, universities, not because I can't hold a job, but I have a diplomatic husband. So I've seen lots of different kinds of students, and I've spent a lot of time trying to understand where they're coming from. And I think, you know, you do get a lot of people saying they can't write. Well, there's a reason why they can't write, and um, they weren't. I've had students come in with papers from their high school teachers that say, excuse the swearing, but this sucks. Like, and that's it. There's no recommendation of how to change it, of how to fix it. So they come in to my English class and they say, I can't write. And I say, how do you know you can't write? Because look at what my high school English teacher wrote. So th what you're saying, nobody's taught them. How, it's not their fault. So I'm awesome you students are. Confidence. not just what they have to do, how to do it, why they need to do it. And so for instance, note taking two methods that started in freshman English, but frankly I teach them in my intermediate seminars too, about um, glossing and double entry notes. And glossing is where you, it's to get them away from just highlighting in a passage what's important, but actually writing in the margin, why is that important and how does it connect to other ideas? And then, I t and then I spend a day where they, I have them put their glossed notes up on the board and we go all the way around and then they um, get validated because their ideas are important. And look at how many other people thought that too. So you're a really good reader and you picked out the important points. So I, I just think that it's really important to understand the students and not just teach. Um, and I also see students come in who say, I always got 100 on my like, you know, I never, I never got any comments. I, I'm a good writer, right? I always, I, I always got 100 on. So there's the, you know, this sucks to, you know, this is perfect. Yeah, what do you mean I'm not a great student? What do you mean I'm not? Give me my A. You know, and I have, I, I mean, I, I have male students from different cultures who also look at me, a female, you know, and there, there are issues about me as an authority figure, giving them a great, what do you mean? Mom said I should have an A. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. What about the work? Um, comment that might help in some way, but it's more exploratory. I teach in the College of Management, and I teach freshmen through juniors and a few seniors, and a couple other of my colleagues in the room also teach in that college. I used to teach writing, and I assign writing assignments two, three times a semester. And as you were talking, Kathy, I was thinking about my students, and I'd say that they write fairly well. And I'm trying to, and now I'm, I'm like you and, and Evangeline, why do I think that they write well? And I'm thinking about that. And I'm wondering if this is true for any of the others here who teach students who've decided they want to go for this major in management. They may have come from high school experiences where they did get good grades in, in writing. And if there's anything, there's no, there's going to be no way to prove what I'm saying, but my own experience has been that they actually have the evidence to back up a thesis statement when they're writing about a case study in management, and these are freshmen. So where did these students come from and why are they in management? That's a more of a question that I don't think I can answer, but it's an observation to make, just to, to compare maybe with American Studies and English. Are they majors in your class? Because some of mine, all, almost all of mine are majoring in management. And, and it's a very interesting commentary on the UMass Boston students in different pockets of our university going for different majors. Um, the, the class for which I've prepared all these different steps, I mostly have non-majors, um, a huge variety of, of preparedness. I mean, I, you know, I've got, I had one student this semester who's graduating in American Studies and I had students who couldn't put three words together, um, and ESL students who, of course, can put three words together, but not in English. Um, and what I find is they can't argue. They can summarize. You know, they really can't. So I still feel like we haven't come back and really talked about the way this moves across disciplines. And I'm, you had your hand up, James. I just oh. I'm giving this back. No, 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 really. <laughs> Let's hear. Mm. Well, you, <laughs> you kind of answered my question the first time around. I, I didn't have a follow-up question well while they were talking I maybe, yeah, you were. okay maybe I was just stretching but 
I, I think for um, me, um, and I teach in sociology, criminal justice, and this evidence-based discussion in their papers versus summarization is something that I, um, is, I'm always working with them on. And I, be, I, be, I got to the point where I created a very specific, these, there's seven sections to this paper, and, and this is how you build your argument, and this is how you support it. And I don't, get, I don't care why you have an opinion. I want to know how are you supporting your, your opinion um, and, and, so, and, and that piece. But I think it's incredibly important to meet our students where they're at. Um, and that in doing that assessment up front within the first couple of weeks and finding out who needs what, right, and then meeting them. I can't, I get so angry when talking to my colleagues when they start talking down about the students at UMass, like somehow it's they're less than, um, and it's like, you know what, meet them where they're at, you're, we're here to teach them, and if they didn't get it, no matter why they didn't get it, it is irrelevant, they're here because they want to be, and let's meet them there and move forward. Um, and just, and then being fluid enough to, to meet them where they're at and what they need to do. I think every instructor in our department talks about how do you get your students to read. And I like that idea of, you know, having that kind of question, note-based um, accountability uh, concept. Do you use anything? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> personal experience or why not realizing that they're using themselves as an outlier, why what they read is complete bunk because, you know, they never experienced that. So what I've done to both encourage reading and to kind of get us more to the evidence instead of the my personal experience is I have them blog every week. So we do a discussion section um, for all of my courses, but they have to blog two nights before and then comment on another student's blog you know, just a short little comment. Um, so that, and I, I did find that that gets them to read um, and helps us move more quickly to the evidence of like, what did the author say? And do we find that convincing? Anybody else to do that or find that useful? I, I, I have a response, but I'd rather hear from you guys first. Well, I have a whole complete different situation. I don't teach at UMass. I teach at a small college, so I, I have different students. However, I think that you have uh, highlighted some of the issues that we face as educators in our age. And especially, I think it's difficult for the student to argue and to uh, um, engage in a process of um, abstracting meaning and critical thinking because they very much are a generation of visual learners. And they, all in, at the college where I teach, I walk uh, by the corridors and almost every professor uses PowerPoints, has to come to the class with some sort of uh, devices that would keep the students' attention throughout the classrooms. Otherwise, they really have a difficulty of just you know, giving them a textbook or an article and being able to um, work with it. And I think it's because they, they grow up really uh, through the social media, through uh, an environment that depends a lot on images more than on words and written texts. I don't know if you um, agree with that or what is your feedback? Um, lots of feedback. So I, I have um, a couple of students that I teach with. Did anybody attend the session before this one? on universal design, right, okay. So I do think that they are visual learners and that they do so much better when they have things to look at. Um, and so this semester, I created a, a lengthy PowerPoint before every class, even though I'm not strictly lecturing. And it, it did take me a while, and I've put all of these PowerPoints into a file on Dropbox that and invited all the students to join. And 
I'm thinking now a little more that I should have these ready for them before they come to class, and I can do that more easily next semester. Um, but let me see if I can, how do I turn this into a slideshow? Okay. So just, so this is to, to come right back to you and say, yeah, back at you. I think you're absolutely right. And I, you know, trying to bring in sound, music, all sorts of things. Um, so I usually have, for the first, first slide for the PowerPoint, these are all the things that we're going to do today. Right? This is what we're going to go through. And then I'm going to flip through this. Um, you may need Dramamine because I'm going to do this really fast. Um, so some important statistics. And they don't have to be writing this down They can because they know they'll have access to this. They can pull this, right? But as I'm walking through the kinds of uh, important changes or statistics that I want them to see, they're right there, right? So talking, talking through. Um, going through you know big things, including maps. Again, I'm I'm running here through this, um, right? So actually putting the text up so they can see it and talking about they can you know it's big enough that they can actually read it. Now I know I could also be closed captioning this or doing you know having I could do a another slide that is a little easier to access um, and then trying to bring in images to keep it rich that way. Um, talking about, you know, again, just trying to do this as quickly as I can. Um, this is a particularly, my PowerPoints usually aren't this full. Um, they had read and taken notes on for this class. I use Howard Zinn. Um, so they had read a chapter, half of a chapter, actually. Um, and then we stopped. So the lecture part is over. We would run through that for maybe 20 minutes. And then we would spend maybe 20 minutes, if it's a, an, a, a class period of an hour and 15, we'd spend 20, 25 minutes discussing, breaking down into small groups, something where I'm not talking at them. Um, and then talking about how, so we were, you know, big question is resistance and rebellion. How do we know how, what slaves' lives were like? And doing a little upstreaming, taking a song that the folklorist Alan Lomax collected in the 1930s during the Depression, um, talking to them about the problems of that recording, um, and then talking about this particular song. Though, and then I can actually play, I don't know if the sound is on for this. <laughs> You know, trying to, is as, you're right, they're oral, they're visual, right? Trying to come at this in as many different ways and then making them at the end of the class stopping with time so that a handful of things happen. One, I ask them, I tell them what's coming because I don't assume that they're going to take the time necessarily to remember or to know. Before they walk out the door, they need to know what they're doing for the next class period. And maybe leaving 10 minutes at the end or five minutes in the end, write down two sentences about what you think the most important points today were. Tell your neighbor what do you think the, you know, the two or three most important things were. Again, it's a process thing. So that, or, or you know, what's the most important points, two points, and what are the two most important pieces of evidence to support those points? Concrete, abstract, abstract, concrete. Trying, sometimes failing, trying. What are you doing in your What are you doing in your classrooms? Other disciplines. I'm just curious. Help me. It's a conversation to start. And um, so I think the perspective of those students are a little bit different. And they, whenever I give them something to do, they don't care about what I say or how to do anything. They just care about jumping in and just getting the problem solved. So what I've done for my classes, and it seems to be effective, is that I tell them that the process is more important. Um, and if you fail and you don't get the right answer, it's completely OK, because that's what's going to happen when you're, when, you, when you're in the real world. Because most of my students are there because they're working or they're trying to get ahead in their job. So I kind of bring in that perspective, because I also don't have an academic background. I have an industry background. So that's once I take away that you don't get as much credit for getting the right problem, you get the process, then they have a completely different perspective on it. So they earn points. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to see how they do it. And that's to me, is just as important as getting the right answer. So. 
also just I want to pop back to the idea of the blogging. I tried doing weekly writing assignments very short the first semester that I was here. And mid-semester, we had just a complete breakdown in the class. And I did what I thought was probably the scariest thing I've ever done. I just stopped everything and said, you know, what's going on? You know, I feel like there's a really negative vibe in here. I'm, I'm really curious what's happening. And one student raised his hand and said, I'm so sick of hearing my friends whose parents pay for them to go to Northeastern and talk about their partying. I've, I belong to the, I, you know, I'm a member of the Coast Guard, and I've been to Cuba and back twice on a submarine, and it's only October. I can't write every week, right? And then another student said, I'm taking care of my boyfriend's two kids, and, you know, my mom's in jail, and I can't, I can't do this. Right, and so I, I said, okay, well, what's, what's realistic? Like, what, what can you do? Yeah, so I have them, they write between 200 and 250 word blogs, so they're really short. Okay, well, I've, I've had success. I love knowing that you've had success. I mean, I, you know, it, it's something to try. Um, I'm finding that it's better to have them do the writing in class. Um, and they can, if they have some kind of keyboard, they can send it to me that way. Or if they're, you know, they want to just write it down and give it to me at the end of the class, just, I, I can't tell you how inspired I am that you are capable of getting this done. I wasn't I happening. Say that in uh, one of my classes this semester, not only did they have to blog, but they also had to do it, which was, is um, external to the community because they're working with a community partner. Um, so the community partner can read it. I can have it. It's, it's a live uh, thing. But they also have to do a personal journal every week, a connecting, connecting what we covered in the ac academy to what's going on in the community, and how do those, what's going on in the community, what's going on, and then interact them. And the majority of them, I had 40 students in my class. The majority of them did it. Um, there was always those that had some problems this week or that week, and we, I said, fine, you know, let's, you know, do a catch-up uh, journal. And so we work with those kind of individual issues, but the vast majority of them did. Um, at one point, they were complaining because, believe it or not, people complain. <laughs> and it's not just the students. Faculty do, too. <laughs> but um, I says, well, you know, we could just do the normal tests that the other classes are doing. Oh, no, 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 this is fine. <laughs> uh, this is going to jump in to identify sociology. Jackie's in sociology, Megan in sociology. And last semester, since we're talking blogs and journals, last semester, um, another professor of sociology, um, Bianca. I'm blanking, Bianca presented in this very room on the use of journals, electronic journals. So that's where I come in. I, my role is to help faculty use some of these technologies that are available in Blackboard. And I just wanted to chime in with the fact that uh, Bianca's presentation was all about how students journaled in Blackboard, but it was for the instructor. And I thought that that was an interesting yeah. difference between the blogs and the journal, which where the blog, they can I assume they can read each other's blogs. And if your goal is to have that kind of interactivity and reading and writing among students, then you know the blog is something that, yeah, that Learn will help you do. The journal was always just between. Great. So. Okay. And then two other important points. The sociology departments decided that one of the things that we're focusing on is learning through writing. Um, so that's, that's a goal of our department. And then the second thing is that in their blogs, I tell them, like, if you did not get this article, that is a fantastic place for me to see. And that, the reason I have them do the blogs and the responses in advance is so I, I can go through and understand what they got and what they didn't get from the readings. So it's really helpful for me, too. Great. Anyone else? Well, I'm standing between all of you and lunch, so I want to thank Kathy very, very much. I agree that you are a great person to have here yes. and to keep us engaged and keep this as a conversation. Well, the, the last thing I'll say is if you see me, if you're actually on this campus and you ever see me again, I want to know more. Um, you can also find me. I'm, I'm Where's the dog park? I want to meet your dog. <laughs> do let me just say the dog is way better than I am. <laughs> you would have had more fun with him. But I, I really am. I'm looking for ways to have important conversations, dialogues, dialectic around this because I feel like until across disciplines we start talking about what really needs to happen in the classroom, no offense to technology, but the, the you know, pedagogically breaking it down, we're not meeting the students' needs. Um, or maybe I'm not and you'd be helping me. So there.
Thank you. Enjoy lunch. Hope it's a good day. All that good stuff. Thanks. Thanks again.